So it's going to be a while. But let me tell you, I was asked on television, if, if one thing could happen in my life before I died, what would I most want it to be? And of course, I gave the real answer, which is tolerance. If w human beings would learn to be tolerant of others. But that was sort of fell flat, in the, and they wanted me to say something else. What's next? I said, next would be clear and unambiguous contact. Not necessarily with intelligence, because that will come, but with life of some other kind. And that is going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years, and this is how it is going to happen. The distance, Kepler now, has told us that the distance between any two Earth-like planets, on average, is roughly 22, year, 22 light years. That's not that far. And we will be putting up telescopes in the next 10 years that will look at all the Earth-like planets around us, and one or more will have disequilibrium gases in the atmosphere. You all know, don't you, that if there are extraterrestrials out there looking at the planet Earth, they know something really weird is going on on this planet because oxygen is in the atmosphere and oxygen is unstable. And therefore, they know that some phenomenon is going on on the surface that's replenishing that oxygen. We will see that too. And then there will be a big push by the human species to alter our entire consent of what we're all about. If there's another place like the Earth, does it have life? If so, what is it like? If not, why not? And is that a place that we could be? So this is what I spend my life doing. There is nothing I could imagine that I could have done that would have left me more fulfilled. If you had told me when I was a 15-year-old boy that any of the things I have managed to do, I could do, I would have not believed it. It has been a dream beyond anything I could have imagined. And now we are on the crest of discovering something that will alter our history forever. The moment human beings interact with intelligence of any kind, remember this, we didn't even come into being as a solar system until September. Imagine what it would be like to encounter intelligence that started off back in March or April. My partner, collaborator in writing Arthur C. Clarke's Law, the technology of an advanced extraterrestrial civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. And so it was, my son Robert and I went to Hovenweep National Monument, raise your hand if you've ever heard of it, it's the third least visited national monument in the whole system, because he wanted to see the Milky Way, and there we are on our sleeping bags, and the Milky Way spreads out against the sky. It is an incredible sight. You should do it if you ever have a chance. Four Corners area, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, nothing around there, you know, except the sky. And it's wonderful, it's 7,500 feet. And while we're there, my son Robert says to me, Dad, why do I feel so comfortable with the stars? And I said to him, because the stars are your parents. He was 15, he just finished chemistry in high school, okay? Some of you may know 15 has the highest smart aleck coefficient of any age, <laughs> okay? So he says to me, come on, Dad. You and mom are my parents. And I decided I would take a different thing. He had just made an A plus in chemistry. And I said, son, what is the molecule that carries oxygen to the tissues? He smiled and said, hemoglobin. Good for you. He said, and what is the atom at the center of hemoglobin? And I said, he said, it is iron. That's good. I said, how does iron get into the human body? He said, hmm, that's interesting. Probably geritol, spinach, things, things like that. <laughs> I said, yeah, but how does it get into the earth to start with? And he says, I don't know. I bet you're going to tell me. He's looked up at the sky. He said, can you give me the short version? <laughs> Once upon a time, I got to tell you this, when I was writing my novels, when I had four, four sons in four years and nine months, and nighttime was on the floor with Dad. Dad would read something he had written, read something from a book, or just make up a story on the spot. And every time when I would start, once upon a time, that was a resonant thing. Now here comes, you know, Dad and the boys. I said, once upon a time, there was nothing here at all in the universe, and all of a sudden, bang, and we don't know why. There was suddenly a giant explosion, and hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium subatomic particles formed this universe, which was inflating at a fantastic rate. And after a certain period of time, 
under the laws of physics that formed, stars began to form. And some of these stars were of the right size that they became supernova. And as they died, they forged protons and neutrons and made the next layer of elements on the periodic chart, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and those. And then those were splashed across the universe and formed into another solar system and another sun formed. And when that one died as a supernova, it sent new chemicals out, iron, manganese, potassium, and those were in the nebula that formed our solar system when it was first there. And they are in your body, Robert. And that is why the stars are your parents. Without the birth and death of two generations of stars, there could be none of us. We could not be here. And I do not care to what you ascribe this miracle. It is the greatest miracle possible. We are chemicals forged in the death throes of stars, risen to consciousness, looking around us and asking fundamental questions about where we came from. And that is an absolute miracle. Thank you very much. <laughs>